let's talk with Pedro Domingos. Hi, Pedro. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Fine, fine. Everything, everything okay there in Washington? Any movement in the White House? Can you see it from there? Well, I'm actually in Washington State, not Washington, D.C. So, ah, okay. I'm, I'm, so you're uh, a little bit Apple. far. You're a little bit far. Yeah, yeah I'm in Microsoft and Amazon, so tech, <laughs> yeah, policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Pedro is a, is a professor in the University of Washington, and his, uh, his, his keynote today will be about micro-logic. So, uh, Pedro, thank you for being here with us. Uh, let me encourage people to make questions. You have the platform to, for, for make questions, of course, in any language, and we will translate it for, for, for Pedro. So, Pedro, thank you again, and uh, let's hear your keynote about this Markov logic. All right. Uh, let's see here. Can you see my slides? Yes, we have them. Okay, very good. So I'm going to talk about unifying logical and statistical AI with Markov logic. Intelligent systems need to deal with the complexity and the uncertainty of the real world. And the language of choice in AI for dealing with complexity is first order logic, and the language for dealing with uncertainty is probability. So we need to combine the two to make progress in AI. And that's what this talk is about. How do we combine first order logic with probability and equally important, once we have that uh, unified representation, how can we learn and reason efficiently using it? And the basic idea is very simple. And it's the following. A logical knowledge base is, is a set of hard constraints on the set of possible worlds. If we violate even one instance of one formula, uh, the world becomes impossible. And that's what makes it so brittle, and that's what we want to avoid. So let's do the following instead. Let's make the formulas soft constraints, such that when a world violates a formula, it becomes less probable instead of impossible. And as you violate more and more formulas, you, you know, the problem just, just degrades gracefully. And, and we're going to give each formula a weight that corresponds to how strongly we believe in it. Something that we really believe in has a high weight, and something that we're not very sure about has, has a lower weight. And then the probability of a state of a world is just the sum of the weights of the formulas that the world satisfies, exponentiated and normalized. So that's, that's the general intuition. Uh, let's you know, make this a little bit more precise. So a Markov logic network, or MLN for short, is a set of pairs FW, where F is a formula in ordinary first order logic with the usual syntax, and W is a real number. Together with a set of constants representing objects in the world, a Markov logic network defines a Markov network, an undirected graphical model, with one node for each grounding of each predicate in the MLN. A grounding of a predicate is replacing its variables by constants, so then it talks about specific objects. And one feature for each grounding of each formula in the MLN with the corresponding weight. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, so let's see a, a simple example to, to illustrate these notions. Smoking causes cancer, and we'd like to get people to stop smoking, but it's hard to do that because it, you know, people are influenced by their friends, and if their friends keep smoking, then people are likely to keep smoking as well. So let's start with a couple of statements in, in natural language. Um, smoking causes cancer, and friends have similar smoking habits. We can translate this easily into first order logic as follows. For every x, smokes of x implies cancer of x, and for every xy, friends xy implies that smokes x is equivalent to smokes y, i.e. they're either both true or both false. Now, the, this was easy, but the thing that's a little odd here is that the statements in natural language were true, and these statements in logic are actually false, because not everyone who smokes gets cancer, and certainly not all pairs of friends have the same smoking habits. Now we can make this be true and useful again by making these statistical statements by adding weights to these formulas and now making them formulas in Markov logic. And the, the formulas that we believe in more will have higher weights. So in this case, smokes implies cancer will have a higher weight. So this is a very simple MLN with just two formulas, but what does it really mean? Right? What does this represent in terms of the real world? Well, let's suppose we have a world with only two people in it. Um, Alice and Bob, so two constants to represent them. And now let's follow our recipe for building a Markov logic network. So we're going to have 
one node for every grounding of every predicate. So for example, we're going to have smokes of Anna, which is just a Boolean variable. That's true if Anna smokes and false if she doesn't. Same, things, same thing for smokes Bob, and same things for cancer and Anna and cancer Bob. Now what about friends X, Y? Well, we're going to have friends Anna Bob, another Boolean variable. We're also going to, that's true if they're friends, we're also going to have friends Bob, Anna, because friendship is not symmetric. Bob could be a much better friend of Anna than she is of Bob, and that actually happens a lot in practice. And, and we're also going to have these degenerate cases of friends Anna, Anna, and friends Bob, Bob, that maybe have to do with their self-esteem. So, so now what we have is, um, is a set of Boolean variables, and the, the MLN defines a probability distribution over them. So what is the probability distribution that it defines? Well, the definition of MLN says that there's going to be a feature for every grounding of, of each formula. And when you have a feature in a graphical model, what that means is that you have a direct connection between the nodes corresponding to the variables involved in the feature. So for example, we're going to have an edge between smokes Anna and cancer Anna because there's a formula connecting the two. And same for Bob. Uh, what about the second formula, slightly more complicated, now what we have is three predicates, right? So what we're going to have is connections, is, is a triangular clique connecting all three predicates in, in, in that formula for every possible uh, combination of instances. So we're going to have a clique between friends and a Bob, smokes and and smokes Bob, and, and so on. And now what we have is just, you know, a graphical model, a Markov network over these, um, over these variables. And what is the distribution that this represents? Well, the probability of a world is just the sum over all formulas of the weight of the formula times the number of times in the data that that formula, in that world, that the formula is true. And, you know, not exponentiated and normalized, so now this becomes an ordinary log linear or exponential family model or, 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 or a Markov network. Notice that the Markov logic network by itself does not represent the distribution. It's more like a program for creating distributions, and that's actually what makes it powerful. And MLN is a template that represents many different distributions, some over very large worlds, some of very small ones, depending on what constants you apply it to. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, this is nice, but this is going to be very inefficient, right? Because this is going to be a, an explosion. There's going to be an exponential number of variables, and, and this isn't even going to fit in memory. And of course, what we're going to see is, is how we're going to make this all uh, efficiently enough to be uh, usable in, in, in practice. Uh, but the first thing you can do that is very easy but goes a very long way is to just have typed variables and constants. If you have a predicate like works for x, y, you only need to replace x by people and y by organizations. And, and that already gets you a long way. Also, um, in, in, in this talk, I'm just going to talk about the very basics of Markov logic, but bear in mind that the full range of constructs of, of first-order logic, like function, functions and existential quantifiers and uh, infinite and continuous domains are all possible, even though I won't, I won't cover them here. So how does Markov logic relate to first-order logic? Uh, well, actually, very nicely, what happens is that first-order logic is the special case of Markov logic that you get when you let the weights go to infinity. When the weights go to infinity, the constraints become hard, and you go back to the case where just violating one of them makes the world impossible, which is, which is what you want. More, well, of course, the more interesting case is what happens when the weights are finite. That's what we're really uh, here for. And, and here, there's also some, something interesting that you can say, which is, if the knowledge base is satisfiable, meaning if you can make the formulas all true at the same time, then, and all the weights are positive, then the satisfying assignments, meaning the assignment of truth values to the predicates that makes all the formulas true, that is a mode of the distribution. So the worlds that first order logic likes are still there in Markov logic, they're just the modes of the probability distribution. And, and as you move away from the modes, the probability degrades gradually, which the behavior you'd like to see. Even more importantly, however, uh, the knowledge base does not have to be satisfiable. In, in logic, if there's, contra there's a contradiction in the knowledge base, then anything follows and basically things fall apart, which makes it very hard to build large knowledge bases or knowledge bases that are combinations of knowledge from multiple sources. In Markov logic, there is no problem at all uh, with contradictions. If there's a contradiction, you just add up the weights on either side and you get the resulting probability. What about the statistical side? 
Well, another nice property of Markov logic is, is that essentially all the types of statistical models that we know and love are special cases of Markov logic. Things like graphical models, including both Markov networks and vision networks, logistic regression, hidden Markov models, uh, conditional random fields. Many of the deep architectures in use today are simple special cases with Markov logic. And we can just write these uh, down uh, with often just two or three formulas. And the key restriction that you, that you have to impose to go from general Markov logic to the statistical models we know is that we have to assume that all the predicates are zero arity, meaning they have no arguments, or they actually have one argument which is equivalent. And what this means is that you're assuming that every object exists in its own separate world. So there are no interactions between objects, or to you know, say technically, the data is IID, independent and identically distributed. And then if you think about is it is a very strong limitation. It doesn't let you model things like social networks or metabolic networks in, in, in biology or the web. With Markov logic, it's very easy to have interactions. You, in, as, as we saw in the example of, of friends and smokers, you just have relations with more than one argument and then, and then weights on the corresponding formulas. So that was the representation. It's nice because it's general and it's simple and it encompasses the things that, that we wanted to encompass. But of course, this is not going to be very useful unless we can do inference with it efficiently. So, so let's look at inference now uh, uh, for a moment. What is inference in, in Markov logic? Well, in some ways, it's no different from, from, evident, from inference in a probabilistic model. You want to compute the probability of some query, given some evidence, and the MLN and the constants that it's being applied to. And this, this uh, uh, is equivalent to, uh, remember, you, you can, when, when, when you um, have constants, uh, you know, that just combines with the MLN to produce a Markov network. And then when you have evidence, what that does is it replaces the, the evidence variables just by their fixed values, so they disappear. So at the end of the day, what you have is you want to compute the probability of a query given a Markov network. And now for this, you can apply any probabilistic inference algorithm that you like. So, you know, for example, Markov chain Monte Carlo, belief propagation, and so on. There is a very big problem with this, however, which is that the ground Markov network that you create when you replace the variables by constants in all possible ways is going to be too large. In fact, it's going to be exponential in clause arity. So if you have a clause with, say, three arguments and even just a thousand objects in your domain, you already have a billion variables. So this is not going to scale. Most of the time, it's not even going to fit in memory. So we need to do something else. And, 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 and what is that something else? Well, this is where the idea of lifted inference comes in. In first order logic, you can prove theorems about infinite domains like the real numbers uh, in a finite number of steps because you do inference at the level of whole sets of objects as opposed to one object at a time. So what we would like to do is bring that into the world of, of probabilistic reasoning. So let's think about how this might happen. The probability of a query is just the sum over all the worlds where the query holds of the probability of the world. So the probability that Anna smokes is the sum of the probabilities of all the worlds where Anna smokes. Now, this is very easy. Of course, the problem is that there's an exponential number of worlds, worlds so you can't compute it this way. Now, if a world can be divided into independent subworlds, so for example, every family is independent of every other family or every country is independent of every other country, then the probability of the world is just the product over the subworlds of the probability of the subworld. So this is already a big simplification. This is kind of like what is exploited in, in graphical models. But now further, if we can group the subworlds into kinds of subworlds that all act the same way, so there's families of one type, there's families of another type, then the probability of a world is just the probability over the, is, is just, sorry, the product over the kinds instead of the probability over the, over the, the worlds of the probability of the sub of any subworld in the kind raised to the number of subworlds in the kind, and this is another exponential uh, improvement. So, with the combination of these two exponential improvements, now now um, uh, uh, inference can actually be tractable. Now, of course, usually in an MLN you don't have independent subworlds because what would be the point? But the key thing is that once you start conditioning on evidence, your graph starts to break up into independent subgraphs. And that's when we can apply this. So to go back to our early example of, of friends and smokers uh, with, with our two constants, Alice and Bob, 
uh, you know, here's a big complicated graph. Now, if you condition uh, uh, on, uh, on, on smoking, right, so first of all, the smokes uh, on, on Anna smoking, so first the, those nodes disappear, right? Uh, smokes Anna, smokes Bob. But also because they disappear, the edges that go into them disappear as well. So now all we have is a bunch of independent subworlds, in this case, each containing just one predicate. And now further, if, if Alice and Bob either both smoke or neither does, then there's only two kinds of worlds. There's cancer, cancer Anna and cancer Bob are one type, and there's all the friends predicates that are another type. So instead of computing the probability of this world by multiplying you know, all of the individual ones, you can just, if you look at the lower uh, right corner here, take the probability of cancer and square it, and take the probability of friends and raise it to the fourth power. And so notice, notice now how, how, how quick this has become. Of course, this is what happens on a good day. On a bad day, uh, for example, Anna smokes and Bob doesn't, or vice versa. So we actually have four kinds of worlds. And, and in the worst case, in this kind of interference will actually not buy you anything, just as in first order logic. What will typically happen is that you're somewhere in between the two. In the best case, you're the, the complexity of inference is order of the size of the MLN, which is really good because it's small. In the worst case, it's the order of the size of the ground Markov network, which is bad. But typically, you're in between the two, and, and, and there's, also, there's typically a lot of lifting that you can do. And uh, there has been a lot of work in, in, this, in this whole direction. Uh, uh, we have managed to synthesize it all into a procedure that we call probabilistic theorem proving, which is a generalization of both theorem proving, as the name implies, and, and inference in, in probabilistic graphical models. And the nice thing about uh, PTP, as we call it, is that it, it generalizes, uh, it encompasses essentially all the major types of inference that people uh, uh, do in AI. So for example, here on the lower left-hand corner of this, you have uh, propositional theorem proving, which of course is, is a special case of this, uh, which is equivalent to satisfiability testing. And that's you know where people started out back in the 60s. Uh, and if you want to count the number of satisfying solutions to a formula, instead of just saying if it's, you know, if it's satisfiable or not, then you get the model counting problem. If you add weights to the formulas, then you get uh, weighted satisfiability, which is the same as inferring the most probable explanation. So this is what is called MPE, inference in a graphical model. And if you combine those two, you actually get weighted model counting, which is what probabilistic inference is. Now, all of these can be lifted to first order, and for example, when you lift pro when you lift propositional theorem proving, you get ordinary first order theorem proving. When you lift weighted model counting, you, you get lifted weighted model counting. And if you combine all of these, you get the full probabilistic theorem proving procedure, which is really just lifted weighted model counting. What about learning? Right, this is all not, not going to be very useful uh, if we don't have some way to learn the MLNs. You might be able to write down formulas, but they're probably being complete and partly incorrect. And also coming up with the weights is something that people are not very good at. So we definitely want to be able to learn uh, these things from data. Well, the data in this case is not going to be a single table as in traditional machine learning. It's going to be a full relational database. And, and we're, we're going to learn from that. Uh, um, we're going to, in this talk, I'm going to make the closed world assumption, which is that a predicate that is not uh, uh, in the database is assumed to be false. Uh, uh, sometimes this is not the right assumption. In that case, you can use EM versions of the algorithms that I'm gonna talk about, but, but I won't cover that here. So there's two main tasks as, as usual in machine learning. There's learning parameters, i.e. The, the weights of the formulas. That can be done either generatively or discriminatively, and we're gonna look at each of those in turn. And there's learning the structure of the model, uh, which is learning the formulas themselves. So, so and, and then there's other things like uh, transfer learning and, and, and discovering latent variables and whatnot, which have also uh, been done in, in Markov logic, but, but I won't go into here. So let's start with generative learning. And the good news is that this is actually surprisingly simple. We actually thought going in that because we're removing the ID assumption, you know, this is gonna be very, very hard. As it turns out, the math is exactly the same. Uh, we want to maximize likelihood. Uh, we can maximize it by gradient descent. It's a convex problem, so there aren't even any, any uh, local optima. And if you look at the expression of the gradient, it's actually very intuitive. The, the partial derivative of the log likelihood with respect to a weight is just the difference between the number of times that that formula is true in the data 
and the expected number of times that it's true according to the model. So if the, if the formula is true more often than the model says, then its weight needs to go up. If it's true less often than the model says, then, then, it, then its weight needs to go down. And once they all match, we've reached the maximum likelihood solution. So this is all very straightforward. There is one very big snag here, which is to compute the expected number of true groundings of a formula according to the model, we have to do inference. And of course, inference in general is intractable, and we have to do this at each step. So most of the time, this is not going to be feasible. So, so what can we do instead? Uh, well, we can use a strategy that was first proposed for Markov networks by, by Julian Bisak back in the 70s, and that is to use something that is similar to likelihood, but yet tractable to compute. And what he proposed and, and, is, and is used for MLNs as well today is what is called pseudo-likelihood. So the pseudo-likelihood is just the product over all variables of the probability of the variable given its neighbors in the evidence, in the data. And, and, and this, of course, is, is tractable because computing the probability of, of a variable according to its so-called Markov blanket is, is a simple operation. And this is also a consistent estimator, meaning that uh, as the amount of data that you're learning from uh, uh, grows, this can, you know, the estimates of these probabilities, of these conditional probabilities, go to their true values. Uh, it's widely used in areas like vision and spatial statistics. But of course, it has some limitations. The main one is that this tends to work well for short chains of inference. Not surprisingly, because you know, when you're doing pseudo likelihood, you're only doing you know, inferences one step away from a variable to its neighbor. What this means is that when you have longer chains of inference, often pseudo likelihood will give you very poor results. So, so what can you do in that case? Well, you can do discriminative learning which is actually usually the best thing to do uh, because you know, uh, it tends to give better results throughout machine learning and, and, and here as well. So the idea in discriminative learning is that we know a priori which variables Y we're going to be querying on and which ones, which variables X are going to be evidence. And then all, all we do is optimize the likelihood, the conditional likelihood of Y given X, as opposed to the joint likelihood of all the variables, which is a much harder problem. And now everything works pretty much the same way. Uh, the nice thing is that as you condition on evidence, a lot of the modes of the distribution tend to disappear. This is what makes probabilistic inference hard, is that there's usually a large, typically exponentially large number of modes, and they're widely separated. But once you start conditioning on evidence, they start to disappear. And often it winds up being the case that the, the answer can be well approximated by just the, the probability at, at, the, at the peak, at the single biggest mode. So instead of having to do this probabilistic inference, we can just find what the most likely state is, which instead of being sharp p complete is only np complete, and 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 use those counts uh, to do uh, to give our answer. So more concretely, uh, how can you do this? Uh, well, there's a number of ways, but the simplest and and and, and the oldest is to use an algorithm that was first proposed by uh, Mike Collins for training hidden Markov models, and that's the structured perceptron. So the structured perceptron works as follows. It assumes that the network is a linear chain because that's of course what an HMM is. And, and what it does is uh, it, it starts out with, the, with all the weights being zero, and then it does the following some number of times. It finds the most likely state of, of the hidden variables, for example, what words you're speaking, given the observations, for example, the sounds that you're hearing. This is of course a typical application. And, and of course, there's a famous algorithm for doing this called the Viterbi algorithm. So use the Viterbi algorithm to infer the most likely state of Y. And then you just do a gradient descent step, where your gradient is the difference between the count of each state in the data and the count of each state in, in this in MAP uh, Y that we inferred. We multiply that by learning rate, we add that to the weights, and that's a step of gradient descent. And at the end, we return the average of this over all steps. Why the average and not the last result? Because you tend to generalize better that way. This is both uh, uh, seen empirically and, and there's theorems to that effect. Now, of course, what we want to do is use structured perceptron for inference in Markov logic. What you actually need to do to make that happen is very simple, is to just allow the network to be an arbitrary graph. And now instead of Viterbi, we use probabilistic theorem proving. So we infer at each step, we infer the most likely state of Y using PTP, and the rest of the algorithm works as before. And this is, this is quite simple, it's very effective, and it's probably the most widely used algorithm 
for learning uh, uh, MLM weights, even though there's some more sophisticated ones that, that, that tend to be faster. What about learning structure? Right? We want to be able to learn the formulas uh, from data, not just you know, learn weights for, for predefined formulas. And if you think about this, this is the problem that generalizes both the problem of feature induction in Markov networks and inductive logic programming, the area that deals with inducing logic programs from data. So there's a lot that we can draw on here. Uh, uh, there's also some uh, significant differences. One is that in inductive logic programming, you only learn horn clauses because that's what a prolog program is, is made of. Uh, and the goal here is to induce any clauses, so you need something a bit more general. Also, in inductive logic program, you typically do some kind of accuracy of information gain as your evaluation measure. But here we're learning a probabilistic model, so it should be a likelihood. And then if you think about how this is going to work, every time we modify a formula, so we have a new candidate formula, we need to relearn the weights. And this is potentially a big problem because relearning the weights is, not, is itself not very fast. Then we're going to have to do this for potentially millions of candidates. So you'd think this would be a big bottleneck. Surprisingly, it actually turns out not to be. If you do a couple of simple things, one of which is you start the new weight optimization at the old weights. Because you know, when, when you change a formula, most of the weights don't change. And if you use a fast uh, optimization algorithm, a second order quasi-Newton method type like LBFGFs or such, you typically converge in just a, a, an iteration or two. Surprisingly, the bottleneck turns out to be something else. It's counting clause groundings. Just counting the statistics that you need to go into this actually turns out to be the bottleneck. Because actually doing that, surprisingly, is itself a sharply complete problem. And when we were learning weights, we only had to do that once at the beginning, but now we have to do that for every candidate formula. Fortunately, here there is also a simple solution, which is to subsample. You don't actually need to count every single grounding of the formula, friends x, y, blah, blah, blah. You can only you can just you can subsample maybe a thousand groundings, and from that you can infer within some you know bounds what the actual answer would be, which is enough uh, to uh, you know to do the learning. So with these, uh, th with, you know, using these various things, it turns out that learning Markov logic networks is about as fast as traditional inductive logic programming or learning features in, in, in Markov networks, which is not super fast, but it's as fast as the things that we're unifying. And later, we will see how to do things that, that are even more efficient. So of course, to be more concrete, uh, when you do structural learning, there's a number of choices that you have to make. The first one is the choice of initial state. If you want to learn purely from data, you can just start with unit clauses, so isolated predicates, and then you start adding things to them. Or uh, you can start with a hand-coded knowledge base that somebody wrote down, and then you can revise it by learning. And, and often, this is actually the ideal use of Markov logic, is you put in your knowledge, and then you revise that knowledge using, using structural learning. Now you need search operators. Those, the obvious ones are, of course, adding and removing a little from the formula. Also flipping the sign of a little, i.e. negating it, because people often, people often write down good formulas, but the implications are in the wrong direction. Uh, we also need an evaluation function. The natural one to use, of course, is pseudo likelihood, because it's the most efficient. But we need to add to that some kind of prior to combat overfitting. And the obvious thing to do here is the same thing that people do in graphical models, which is to have a, a prior that penalizes divergence from the initial network. So every time you add or remove a little, you pay a penalty, and you only do that if the gain in likelihood exceeds the cost of doing that. So very simple, but very effective. And then finally, of course, you need to choose what kind of search to use. Uh, people have you know, tried all kinds of things. Beam search, which comes more from the ILP side. Shortest first, shortest first search that comes more from, um, from the Markov network side, and, and a whole bunch of others. And, and you know, it's in some ways a matter of taste. Uh, which one you want to use. OK, so we have Markov logic as the unified representation. We have some fairly efficient inference and learning algorithms for it. Are we done? Well, actually, no. We're, we're not done by any means, because this is still not industrial strength. To have something that can be deployed in industry, it has to be very scalable, and it has to be very reliable. Anything that requires approximate inference uh, you know, is a little bit dubious to use in production. So what we need to do is actually what people have done in classic AI, which is come up with tractable subsets of Markov logic, such that inference in them will always be efficient and exact. And then, you know, we can really deploy this and be confident 
that it will work as expected. And that's exactly what we've done. Uh, we've developed something called tractable Markov logic, which as the name implies, is a tractable subset of Markov logic. And not surprisingly, this language is very similar to the classic ones. Uh, uh, you know, basically it has uh, objects and subparts and, and class hierarchies. And it's by exploiting them uh, that the efficiency, that the inference is made efficient. So in, in tractable Markov logic, there are three types of weighted rules and facts. Subclass rules, uh, as the name implies, are rules of the form a family is a social unit. A subclass fact uh, is something of the form the Smiths are a family. Then there are subpart rules, things like uh, uh, every family has two adults. Uh, notice that not every family has two adults, but that's okay for us because at the end of the day, this guy is going to have weights and just going to be statistical regularities. And the subpart fact is something like the first adult in the Smiths is Alice. And then, of course, finally, uh, relation rules like, um, uh, you know, every, every, in every family, every adult is a parent of every child. Again, not always true, but true a lot of the time, and we can learn a wait for it. And then finally, of course, just simple facts like Alice and Bob are married. And the remarkable thing is that inference in this language is always linear in the number of rules and objects. It's not just tractable, it's linear. And in fact, in practice, when you actually do the evaluation for a query, it's, it's sublinear. It's, you, you know, linear would be, you know, looking at all the rules and all the objects and typically you only need to look at a small subset of them. So what happens at the end of the day is that in tractable Markov logic, you can actually do interactive querying. Answering a query typically takes less than, you know, it takes a fraction of a second. And, and it gives you probabilistic answers uh, in, uh, that are exact, that are not approximate. Why, why does that happen? Well, the reason is that by design, the structure of the knowledge base mimics the structure of the computation that has to, to happen when, when, you, when you're uh, computing probabilities. So in particular, the probability of an object given its class is the product of the subparts of the object of the probability of the subpart given the class. So this is one thing that makes things tractable. And the other one is that the probability of anything given a class is just, it is a mixture model. It's the sum over the subclasses of the probability of that thing given the subclass times the probability of the subclass. So what's going to happen is that for every object node, there's going to be, for every object in the, in the, in the, in the knowledge base, there's going to be a product node in the resulting sum product network of the computation. And for every, uh, 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 class, there's going to be a sum node summing over the subclasses. And, and, and as an application of this, uh, we have developed what is, to our knowledge, by far the largest probabilistic knowledge base ever built. Um, we did it by extracting information from classic web sources like DBpedia, Yago, and Nell, and merging them all together, which of course is something that Markov logic is very good for. And at the end of it, we have a, a, a knowledge base with millions of objects and billions of parameters. But as I mentioned, uh, you can return exact answers to queries in, in, in fractions of a second. Uh, this, of course, is just one of many applications that people have done. Uh, Markov logic uh, uh, has been applied widely in uh, natural language processing and in information extraction, which are obvious applications, but also in things like uh, link prediction, social network analysis, in robotics, in vision, uh, in computational biology, psych, the famous uh, largest knowledge base ever built. Uh, parts of it have been made probabilistic using Markov logic. Also, personal assistants, the famous DARPA Kalo project that Siri grew out of, uh, used the Markov logic as the core representation uh, and inference language, and many others. Uh, Markov logic has been um, widely uh, researched in academia. In fact, this body of work is one of the most uh, widely cited, cited bodies of work in AI uh, of, uh, of recent times. Uh, it's also been used widely in industry, not just by the large tech companies like Google and, and, and Facebook, but, but my, by many others as well. And research and progress continue. So to summarize, um, I would say that at this point, we have largely succeeded in, in unifying logic and probability. Uh, using Markov logic, there's of course many languages to do this, but Markov logic is the most general and simplest and also by far the most widely used and, and the most developed. And, and what Markov logic does is just assign weights to first order formulas and then treat that as, as, as the features and weights of a probabilistic model. Uh, we and many others have developed powerful and inference and learning algorithms for Markov logic uh, 
And I, I, I believe that we now have a good foundation for modern AI where you, you don't have to start with logic and then, you know, deal with uncertainty using hacks or start with graphical models or, and deal with relations using hacks, which is what people did before. There's, of course, uh, still much more to do. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about Markov logic, uh, I recommend you take a look at this article that came out last year in the communications of the ACM. Uh, there is also a, a book that's a little bit older. Uh, there's, there's things that uh, we talked about here that aren't covered in the book, but it still uh, you know, covers a lot of, of things that the article doesn't. There's also a nice website, uh, Alchemy, uh, the, the URL is right here, that contains both the Alchemy open source imp implementation but also pointers to other open source implementations and also papers, uh, pointers to the literature, MLNs, data that you can learn from, and so on. Uh, thank you, and, and I will take questions now. So thanks so much, Pedro. Let's give some minutes, uh, well, minutes, seconds to, 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 to get some questions. People is a little bit shy today, so maybe there's no questions, but let's see. No questions? So it seems there's no questions. So thank you, Pedro, for being with us to, uh, today. Uh, take care and keep in touch. Maybe maybe people yeah. sign now, but maybe later they drop you a line or something like this. So th 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 that's the idea to keep in touch and, and begin the conversation. So thank you, Pedro. Sure, thank you.